All right, so this was the example that we considered yesterday. We found the delay from register to register. In this case, there are two paths. One is from U1 through U4 to U2. And the other one is from U2 through U3 to U1. Okay. Out of those, the more stringent condition, the tighter condition is given by U2, U3, U1. And what it says is, the T must be greater than or equal to 5 nanoseconds is the TCQ of U2 plus 8 nanoseconds plus T seconds, 3, 3 nanoseconds. The input to register delay was given by from A to U2 and A to U1. There are two different paths. Right? The longer of those two paths. Essentially, what is the setup time of A? with respect to the clock. Okay? And for that what we said was once A is launched it takes 1 plus 7 plus 3 that is 11 nanoseconds to reach U2 minus 2 nanoseconds because the clock itself is coming late. So a total of 9 nanoseconds. But to U1 it takes 1 plus 8 plus 3 so that is 12 minus 2 nanoseconds because the clock is coming late. So, 10 nanoseconds is the setup time from A to the clock. In other words, if I am looking at this overall system as a black box with the clock being applied to it and then the input A also being applied, if the clock is going to change at some, some time, let's say 20 nanoseconds or 0 nanoseconds, okay, let's take it as the clock is changing at 0 nanoseconds, then A must have settled to its correct value 10 nanoseconds before that, at time equal to minus 10 nanoseconds, so that there is no setup violation at the flip-flop U1. Okay, that is what this particular statement means. Similarly, we also did an analysis for hold time, but the hold time does not directly impact the clock period, so we are not concerned about that. Right? In this case, the next cycle of the clock can only come after the A has been successfully captured inside the flip flop. So after I have launched one A, what is telling is I must wait at least 10 nanoseconds before I can give the next value for it. At least 10, it may be greater than that. In this case what we find is the clock to clock or register to register delay is 16 nanoseconds. So that is worse than the A to clock delay. So the actual clock period is going to be determined by so far at least what we can see register to register delay, not the input to register delay. Okay. The next parameter that we considered was the clock to output. Okay. So a clock edge arrives, how much time does it take before the output becomes stable? In this case also, there are two parts, both of them in this case have the same delay, whether it is from clock to U1 to U5 to U6 or clock to U2 to U5 to U6, both of them are the same.
and in this case the clock itself comes to nanosecond place u1 has a tcq of 5 u2 has a delay of 9 and u6 has a delay of 6 so 22 nanosecond okay and the last parameter of interest over here is in this particular circuit we have a direct combinational path going from the input to the output okay so from a there is a path leading directly through to y what is that path it passes through u7 then u5 and u6 okay what is the delay of that path this is a direct combinational path it goes u7 u5 and u6 the delay is 1 nanosecond plus 9 plus 6 so this is also 16 nanosecond okay so these are all the different parameters that can possibly affect the clock period what we are saying is the clock should be such that any one of the all of the delays need to be completely satisfied before the next clock edge can come okay so in other words the worst case the largest among all of these is what determines our clock period okay in this particular case what we find is the register to register delay is not the worst case this one the clock to output is the worst case okay so as far as the overall system is concerned t must be less than sorry, greater than or equal to 22 nanosecond okay so what does that mean it means that you are giving some kind of a square wave clock pulse and this time period of this pulse is t right this must be greater than or equal to 22 nanosecond what does that imply for the frequency of the clock what is frequency one over time period right so frequency must be less than or equal to 1 over 22 nanosecond in this case this is approximately 45 megahertz right so the maximum operating frequency of this circuit is 45 megahertz that ultimately is what all of this analysis is telling us maximum safe operating frequency right so then comes the question what happens if i do not operate at this operating uh, below this operating frequency what i'm saying is as long as i operate below this operating frequency all of the signals have had time to reach their destination and become stable before the next clock edge arrives right whether it's the setup time from a to input as given a it has taken more than it has taken at most 10 nanoseconds to reach the register and stabilize I am giving 22 nanoseconds. This means that A has had plenty of time to become stable, and there are no further issues as far as A changing around just next to the clock edge is concerned. Okay. Clock to output has also been taken care of. As given the clock, 22 nanoseconds later, the output has come and has been captured by someone else. Now I can give the next clock first, and safely allow any transitions to happen inside the circuit. Okay. So by taking 22 as my bound, all of the conditions, all the changes that are possible have been taken into account, and the transitions are safe. So, so, so. Okay. What happens if I operate at a higher clock frequency? Let's say at 100 megahertz. So that's a 10 nanosecond clock. What will happen in this case is some clock edge will arise. The data will come out of U1. It will be passing through U5. right so to come out of u1 it has taken 5 nanoseconds it is then passing through u5 it takes 9 nanoseconds to pass through u5 
in the meantime already the next blockage has come at the input okay what does that imply will it automatically mean that the circuit fails and gives you wrong result it may or it may not okay if you are lucky it may be that the data which pass through into u5 uh, will still continue to pass through u5 and then will go through u6 and reach the output and the next data will also be able to come through that but there is no such guarantee that is the definition of propagation delay okay it is not a hard and fast number it's not in other words this propagation delay that i have given here is the worst case propagation delay i am not telling you what is the minimum propagation delay in this case. right so because of that what happens if you run at a higher clock frequency there is a chance that the data which is passing through the system while it is midway through before it has crossed all the circuit elements that it is supposed to the clock changes again that introduces some new data into the circuit which interacts with the old data and gives you wrong results at the output okay so all of this analysis is to make sure that does not happen as long as you run at lower than this frequency you will not have that issue okay now the next thing that we are going to see is how do we improve this how do we improve the clock frequency before getting to that let's take a small diversion and address the question that we raised at the beginning of the class what happens if my clock or my first view to something like this i have a clock going here but after this i have a buffer not an inverter just a buffer a delay in other words the clock that is going here so the clock a and the clock that's going to b are delayed with respect to each other okay this is a common phenomenon in any design this is definitely going to happen simply because of the fact that the clock itself is being routed over some kind of metal wire the metal wire itself has some resistance and capacitance associated with it because of the how big the capacitance is that is being driven that is to say you are driving so many different flip flops it is entirely possible that this delay can become significant this is known as clock skew right the clock arriving at the two different flip flops is not identical it's not at the same instant of time so clock skew is something that is almost guaranteed to happen in any circuit getting around it designing a circuit which does not have clock skew is quite difficult so in such a situation what happens how do you do the analysis okay so once again the same thing when does the clock is arrive at a let's assume that it arrives at some time zero okay zero plus ccq of a is the time at which the data comes to the output of a this plus the propagation delay of the combinational logic is the time when it arrives at the input of b this plus the setup time must normally be must be less than the time when the next clockage arrives at b okay when does the next clockage arrive at t plus the skew that is this is the clock period plus the skew between the two flip flops okay so this is the way that you write the analysis when you have skew between the two flip flops right so one thing that you can see from this what does this imply for the maximum value of t or the minimum value of t t must be greater than or equal to some quantity if there is skew between the flip flops like this what can you say about that what will happen to t will it go up or go down huh in this case it goes down 
right? Because T Q is some, there is some Q between flip flop A and flip flop B. So in other words, your maximum, your minimum time period is decreasing, or your maximum clock frequency is increasing. Okay? So it looks as though clock Q is actually helping you over here. The problem is, it's not always helpful. What if I had another path from B to A? Right? In that case, the clock Q, the equation would be exactly the same, but the clock Q is related. It is how much far earlier does the clock arrive at A than at B? Okay? So if I have a path from B to A and I am trying to do the analysis for that, then T Q will be negative for that part. Right? Meaning that now the T, the clock period, has to actually increase. So in other words, just because this equation looks like this does not mean that you can reduce the value of T by introducing clock Q into the system. Okay? If you gain somewhere, you will probably lose somewhere else. So you are gaining on the on one path which is going in one direction. But the other path which is going in the opposite direction will lose. Okay? So this is what happens in the presence of clock Q. You can still do the analysis in exactly the same way. You need to think in terms of when is the data being launched or given out of one flip flop and when is it being captured, caught at the next flip flop. Okay? That is the analysis which is ultimately required over here. Alright, so now getting back to our circuit, yes. On the? Okay, so that's a good question. Is there any constraint on the duty cycle of the clock? What do you think? Okay, how many people think that there is a constraint on the duty cycle of the clock? How many people think there is no constraint? Okay, why? Why why would there be no constraint? These are edge triggered flip flops, right? So for this kind of circuit where we are talking about edge triggered flip flops, there is no constraint on the duty cycle because all transitions on the flip flop happen only corresponding to an edge on that flip flop. Okay? Once the edge has passed, until the next edge arrives, there is nothing that can happen to the flip flop. Nothing can change at its output. Okay? There are certain other considerations like the overlap times and so on. But as long as the flip flops are designed properly, either using T square mass which is insensitive to overlap, or using some other kind of design where the clock Q and overlap is not really significant, then the duty cycle does not play any role. Okay? So as such, for H3 word flip flops, the duty cycle is irrelevant. Right? Which is why you may remember I mentioned that there are certain types of flip flops that are called pulse latches where what you do is you just give a single short pulse as the input to a transparent latch and use that as the edge for the to make it into a register, to make the latch into a register, edge figure register. Right? That works because you don't care about the duty cycle. As long as that edge came and the pulse was very short, the transition has taken place. No further transitions are allowed until the end of the time period. Okay? But when you go to level sensitive latches, the story is quite different. Timing analysis becomes significantly more difficult over there. Okay? Part of the reason is because the duty cycle also starts to matter and you need to now see during which time the data allowed to come out of the flip flop, during which time is it not supposed to change in the flip flop. Okay? Right now the analysis we are doing is only for edge trigger. Later we will look at level trigger also. Edge trigger could be made out of two level triggered master slaves, but that's not necessary. There are no, even if it is made out of two uh, level triggered master slaves, the internal structure is such that, remember, one of them goes opaque and the other one goes transparent. 
So the data, the output of the eight figure flip flop can only change based on the location of the egg. It does not depend on the beauty cycle. Unless the beauty cycle becomes very small, such that one of them is you know, simply not able to pass the data through or something like that. As long as there is enough time for the latches, individual latches, to pass data through them, then the actual beauty cycle does not matter. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, because I am considering, remember the circuit that I am looking at, this red box in the bottom, right? So as far as this box is concerned, I am giving the clock at some time zero, but inside the box, the clock is reaching the flip flops only at time two. So when I consider for this red box, what is the time delay between the clock to output, I will give the clock at time zero, if you go inside, if you go to the flip flop, then it will come out of the flip flop, then we go through the gates and then finally reach the output. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right now I don't know that. The point is as far as the red box is concerned, I don't know what is causing the delay, whether there is a buffer for the clock which is causing the delay or whether there is something else which is causing the clock to get delayed so that the clock to output is becoming 22 nanoseconds. I don't know the reason why it is there. I only, I only know that I apply a clock, I measure it at the output and I see the 22 nanoseconds later the data has come. I don't know whether it is because of an internal buffer delay which is going to be constant or whether it is due to propagation delay of a gate or something else. Yeah. Correct, but when you are writing this, because you don't know how exactly the analysis is going to be, how this box is going to be used. So when you are doing the analysis for the, you are right, if I am doing the analysis only for, for a system where the clock is completely controlled. So let's say that even the inputs and outputs of this are connected to other systems for which I know when the inputs and outputs are arrived. Then it will become all register to register delay. There will be no clock to output delay as such that I need to worry about. Okay. So this is when you are talking about a system that is self-contained by itself. But this system is going to be used inside some other larger design. In that larger design, if I also know when the inputs and the outputs are arriving, or rather when the inputs are arriving and when the outputs are required, then I can do the analysis, everything will become register to register because there will be some register at the output of the previous state, some register at the input of the next state. So all of these things, the input to output delay and so on, will get converted into register to register delay. Okay? All right. Going further, yeah. No, no, no. I am telling you that you are given this design. You are asked to give the timing corresponding to it, treating it as a black box. Okay. So if somebody else wa wants to use this, let's say that this red box over here is a chip that you are designing. And somebody wants to use that chip. Okay. You have to tell them, you have to give them a data key saying what is the maximum speed at which they can operate this system. Okay. So that is what it comes down to. Finally what you are saying over here is you have to be able to tell somebody else what is the maximum speed at which this system can operate. For that you have to do the analysis inside the system. You have to know what is there inside the system, what are the registers which are there inside the box. That is the analysis that we are doing over Okay. So finally the result of all of this analysis will be some kind of a data sheet, something that says there are these delays. So actually coming back to the question that we raised, rather than just saying outright that T must be greater than or equal to 22 nanoseconds, Usually what will be given in the data sheet is, inside this box, the register to register delay is so much. Which means that the clock that you use must be at least that much. At the same time, there is also a delay from input up to the register. In this case, it's 10 nanoseconds. There is also a delay from register to the output. Right? Which in this case is, from the time that you give the clock 
it is going to be 22 nanoseconds. And there is also a direct combination of path delay which is going all the way from input to output. So you specify all of those terms in the data sheet and the person who is using that box as part of their design needs to make sure that their timing analysis, the clock period that they use, satisfies all the constraints for this box. Okay. So this, what we are discussing right now is how do you do the analysis inside the box once you are given the details of what is there inside the box. How do you do the analysis and come up with these numbers on the clock uh, period. Okay. Alright. So, the next question that we can ask is, how can I improve this, right? How do I improve the clock speed or the frequency of operation of this particular design, right? Now, one of the things you would notice over here is, in this particular design at least, it was not even the register to register delay which determines the clock frequency, right? There was a direct combinational path from input to output which also had the same delay as register to register. And on top of that, there was also another path which went from clock all the way to output which also had an impact on the maximum operating frequency of the system. Okay? So, in general, what is recommended for digital design is that when you are designing a box like this which somebody else is going to use you avoid having all of these other things such as the direct combinational paths and the input to register delays and so on. One way of doing that is to say you will directly put flip flop at the input and the output of the system. Okay. Now, why am I drawing it after U7 and before U6? Because U7 and U6 are the actual input-output buffers of the system. You cannot avoid them. Okay. So, what we are saying is, as soon as the data comes into the system, you put a register and capture it into a flip flop. Okay. Now, whether you can do this or not is another question. That is something that we will get to later. That comes to the problem of what is known as pipeline. Right? For the time being, what we are saying is, assume that any input data, I can directly capture it into a register. Same way the output, before it leaves the system, I can capture that also, in the, I can capture it into a register and then let it out from that register alone. So, what is the advantage of doing that? Let's take a look at the same analysis, but now keeping these numbers in mind. One thing that has happened is, as a result of this, one new additional register to register, or not one, actually, two additional, three additional paths have come which are register to register. Right? So we we'll call this as U9 and this as U10. Okay? So there is a path from U9 to U10, a path from U9 to U uh, to U2, and a path from U9 to U1. Those are the three new register to register paths that have come. Right? And actually similarly there is also a path from U2 to U10 and U1 to U10 as well. Okay? So the number of register to register paths, which was very small earlier, you had only U1 to U2 and U2 to U1 has now suddenly gone up drastically. Okay? But you can enumerate all of them and do the analysis and when you come up with that analysis what happens is you will find that the longest such path in the new design is going to be U9, U5, U10 because U5 has the delay of 9 nanoseconds, the largest value among all of them. Right?
So these registers that are put over there, one is the input, one is the output, I'm calling them pipeline registers for now. Right? We'll explain what pipelining is and get to the details of that later. Okay? But with those registers in place, U9, U5, U10 becomes longest register path. How long is it? It is now 5 nanoseconds plus 9 plus 6. Sorry, plus 3. The set of time. And this becomes 17 nanoseconds. Okay? So in some sense this is bad because previously I had a register to register longest path of 15 nanoseconds. Now it has become 17. Okay. But now let's look at what was the longest path earlier. What about the clock to output? In this new design, clock to U2 to U5 to U6 is no longer a path. Because U10 is there at the output. Okay? So, what is the path that is there from clock directly to output? Clock to U10 to U6 to output. That's the only way by which the clock can affect the output. Okay? I'm going to assume that U9 and U10 also have the same clock signal. So, it is after the buffer. Okay? The same clock signal after the buffer is what is fed to U9 and U10. This means that the analysis there once again becomes U8 for the clock to U10 the output flip clock to U6 to output. Okay. So it becomes 2 nanoseconds for U8, 5 nanoseconds for U10 that is the TCQ. 6 nanoseconds for U6 and that's it. It has reached the output. Okay? So this has now become 13 nanoseconds instead of the 22 which it was earlier. Okay? So from 22 nanoseconds that number has come down to 13. So the net result is that Overall, T, as far as the system is concerned, must be greater than or equal to 17 nanoseconds, not 22. Okay? So, adding those two registers at the input and output has actually helped to improve my overall design. It can now run at a faster speed. Okay? We are assuming, of course, that you want to run at a faster speed. Right, because ultimately the goal of digital design is to have a circuit which can run at a certain speed. In this case, we are going to assume that the fastest possible speed is what we want. Okay. So now T must be only greater than 17 nanoseconds, not necessarily 22 nanoseconds. So that's an improvement. Okay. And that came about because we applied those two pipeline registers. All right. Now, let's take this further and say what happens if we have a more general kind of a circuit, right? Something which has a lot more combinational elements. Then how do we do the analysis? Okay? So the first thing we are going to say over there is any circuit which has combinational elements in a cycle, right? This is not permitted. Okay? 
Now, we are just defining that as well. Effectively, what we are saying is, if there is a cycle in the combinational circuit, then we don't know how to do timing analysis. Why is that? Because a combinational circuit, there are no registers in it. Okay, they are all combinational gates, or gates, and gates, man, gates, something of that sort. And they form a cycle like this. Okay? So what happens in such a situation is that, you are effectively in some sense saying that, the input to one of these gates, must be present, before its output has come. If we go by the analysis that we have been doing so far, right? So far what we are saying is, the input arrives, after some time the output of that gate changed. That in turn was input to the next gate, it became the output of that gate. So it cascades through this, it goes step by step through the different gates in the system. When I have a cycle of this sort, that input, the last output becomes the input of the first gate. Now is it the input corresponding to this particular clock cycle or the next cycle? I don't know because there is no register anywhere in the system to break it up into cycles. Okay? So this is known as a combinational cycle. And this is not permitted for so called synchronous digital design. What do I mean by synchronous design? Digital of course we know what it means, but the synchronous part says that this is a clock circuit, something which we are trying to analyze based on application of a clock. Okay? Which means conversely that there are also circuits that are asynchronous, which don't have a clock associated with them. Right? We are not talking about such circuits, that those circuits are completely beyond the scope of this course, we will not be analyzing them at all. Right? This course is entirely about synchronous digital design where we assume that we have registers those registers are controlled by a clock and then there is combinational logic which is carrying the computation between registers. Okay. For such kind of design a combinational cycle like this is not permitted. Can you think of a circuit that all of you should be familiar with that does have combinational cycle. Huh? Bicycle. Right, the bicycle circuit, the two inverters back to back. Right? So that's a very simple example that we have been considering so far. Okay, two inverters back to back is an example of a combinational cycle. So it's sort of contradictory over here. Because after all, all the latches and registers that we are talking about are usually composed of those combinational cycles. Right? But we are saying that the combinational logic which you are using should not have any cycles in it. Okay? Any cycles of this sort should be restricted to your latches or registers and should be analyzed separately from the rest of the timing of the circuit. Another example of a combinational cycle is a SR latch, right? What is the structure of that? The basic thing is something like right? This kind of a circuit is a combinational loop or a cycle. The moment you have a circuit of this sort, once again you cannot do timing analysis on it. Okay? So now what we say as far as the overall approach to timing analysis is that once you don't have any combinational cycles in the graph or in the circuit, right? You can model your circuit as a structure which looks something like this. There are registers over there, there are inputs coming in from them, going to some gate, those in turn are going through other multiple gates, and 
and coming through to some output. There may be multiple outputs also. Okay. This is a register boundary or a clock boundary. And the rest of the elements inside are combinational logic. They are only combinational. There cannot be any registers in this, in between those two boundaries that are drawn over. Okay? So, how will the timing analysis for something like this work? All the registers will get a clock. There will be some TCQ after which the data will come through to the output. That will then pass through each of these individual gates and reach the output. Okay, there you will have to have a set of time. Okay. What that means is, now effectively whatever is there in, inside my circuit is some combinational logic cloud for which I need to do a timing analysis. Right? Now, the whole point of doing it in this way is the timing analysis now becomes fairly simple and straightforward to do. Okay? For this particular circuit, right, without worrying about what the types of gates are, assuming that the delay of every gate is 1 nanosecond, what would be the maximum, the, the minimum time period that can be used for this circuit? Don't worry about what type of gates they are. The delay through every gate over here is 1 nanosecond. There are a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 gates. Right? I want to write T greater than or equal to something. What is that value? Huh? So, somebody has given the answer 5. How do you get that? Huh? It's not from TCQ. So TCQ and T setup has not even been given. I am telling you that TCQ and T setup are zero. Okay? So assume that TCQ and T setup are zero for now. One nanosecond for every one of the combinational blocks. How do I find the delay? So effectively what you need to do is find out every single path which is there from input to output and find the longest one among all of those. Right? That is the correct way of doing the timing analysis over here. We need to go from input to output through every single possible path that is there in the circuit and find out what is the longest path that is present in the circuit. Okay? T must be greater than that longest path because only then can I guarantee that the TC2 plus the delay through the combinational logic plus T setup will not have any timing violations anywhere. What do I mean by timing violation? There will be a setup violation because the data arrived too early or changed too close to the clock end. Okay? So now, number of parts. In general, when I have a circuit of this sort, how many parts can be there? If I have n circuit elements inside the circuit. Can you tell me something about what would be the maximum number of paths that can be present inside the circuit? Huh? Maximum, maximum possible. Is it NC2 or is it n or is it 2 power n? Okay. We will stop here for now. Go back and think about this. Essentially, the number of paths can be very large. You need to get an estimate of what that number of paths is. The main point is, it is not in general possible to enumerate all possible paths. Okay. So, then comes the question of how do we do the analysis instead. Okay. We will continue with this.